Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and this is Lecture 8C. Uh, this is going to be a lecture in which we look at constructability and reading and interpreting drawings uh, with regards to building systems and the building envelope. So I'm going to try to orient you to how information is typically shown on a set of construction drawings and what it actually means from the construction perspective and some of the things that aren't shown. And this is based on chapters 11 and chapters 12 of my Understanding Construction Drawings for Housing and Small Buildings textbook. Um, so I thought we could start out maybe with the Doncaster drawings that came with your textbook and I'll highlight some of the key building systems elements like the electrical wiring, the exhaust fans, um, toilet sinks, basin locations, uh, that type of information. And then I move on and start looking a little bit at uh, the building envelope and the type of information you find there. Then partway through, I'd like to switch to the brook drawings and just compare and contrast some of the information that you'll find. Uh, particularly with the brook drawings, the building systems in particular, the electrical layouts are done on a separate floor plan or a series of separate floor plans um, to show that separate from all the other architectural requirements, which means it's getting a little bit more like a commercial drawing would be where it's got separate layers of information and separate plotted drawings depending on the information that you're looking for. So let's get started. Let's take a look. Um, so as you're aware, you, with a set of drawings, you usually have some sort of construction notes. Generally, it's on the first page or the second page of the drawing. Sometimes it's on the last page of the drawings, um, but it's somewhere there that it can be referenced. And we already know the hexagon symbols will refer us to um, particular areas of information. Like I look here, it says number six, the hexagon symbol. And then I, I can get information on the foundation, but in this particular case, number six is pointing to weeping tile and um, crushed stone over and around the weeping tiles. And of course, when we talk about building systems, well, the weeping tile is going to tie into our drainage system. And in the chapter, we discuss having uh, drainage systems and what the drainage systems actually go into. Uh, in the city of Toronto, we are, in a lot of the older streets, there's only one um, sewer that takes away both our um, sanitary or black water, as it's referred to, water from a toilet, but it also tends to take away um, our, um, if we've got rainwater leaders going into a drain, it's, it's combining with that. Whereas in a newer development, um, those would be separated out. So the black water is only going in um, to the one waste drains, the black water and the waste from sinks, uh, as opposed to cleaner water, which would be like water from a weeping tile, water from a rainwater leader, water from uh, stormwater drains on the street, etc. Um, so uh, if you need more information on that, go through chapter 11. There's a few. Um, there's a few video, uh, sorry, few <laughs> mentions uh, floor plans on uh, how those are laid out and in the previous videos uh, on building systems, which was lectures uh, 7A and 7B, those are discussed too. But I want to stick more with the drawings in this particular case. So let's, let's talk about the drawings. And every set of drawings has a legend. I've probably mentioned that before, but this is how that particular designer is laying things out. So in this case, we have Cassidy and Company, uh, excellent architectural uh, company, uh, does a lot of production homes, and they have sort of a standard um, legend that they use. And so you can sort of see what the various symbols are and what they actually mean. This is for a class B vent. You don't see too many of them used um, now, uh, but it could be for like a, uh, they used to be for the mid-efficiency mid furnaces, etc. Um, so a class B vent, I don't think we'll see that too much on these drawings. Uh, the exhaust vent, uh, this would be for a fan, uh, an exhaust fan. So uh, any kind of washroom will have an exhaust fan. You might have an exhaust fan uh, near the um, kitchen where you've got the hood fan over the stove. 
Uh, you'll probably have an exhaust fan in a laundry area or laundry room. So you look for them, that kind of symbol around those areas. Uh, this is your regular duplex outlet. It just is a standard outlet. You've got a plug on the top and a plug on the bottom, your regular outlet. Uh, and it's saying that it will be placed 300 millimeters high. So that means standard from the floor to the box. And again, you could interpret that a specific way, but it would be consistent floor to the bottom of the box. That would be 12 inches, basically 300 millimeters. Then you see this one. It looks like the same one, but it's got a number beside it. And so the number represents the height from the floor to the box. And so uh, that number doesn't always have to be 1,070. Whatever the number is, that's the height you place the box at. So think about a kitchen counter, a vanity counter in a bathroom. What's the height for that outlet going to be? And so if you hear the term um, duplex outlet or re duplex receptacle, it really means the same thing as well. And you see a number beside it. That's the height from the floor to um, the receptacle or the outlet box. You also have weatherproof duplex outlet. So a weatherproof um, duplex outlet is uh, for um, the actual uh, outdoor receptacles or the outdoor um, plugs that you would see um, utilized. And they have a cover. And so it just means that they're weatherproof. It doesn't say that they have a GFI or GFCI. They would because the electrical code will require it. Generally speaking, you'll see something like this on the drawings, all construction practices to comply with Ontario Building Code regulations or whatever province you may be in or state you may be in, you'll, you'll find those kind of details. And that's the designer saying, hey, this project, it has to meet all the regulatory requirements. And within the Ontario Building Code, it says that it needs to meet the Canadian Electrical Code requirements. So one thing leads you to the other. So it means it's got to comply. Uh, and um, that's important that it says that. So you know that when it's a weatherproof uh, duplex outlet, well, electrician knows, well, it's outside. I have to put a GFI on it, right? Or it's close to a sink. I have to put a GFI on it. And the, bil uh, the building code's changing constantly and so is the electrical code so they have to keep up to date on um, these aspects they would also know if this is an arc fault uh, protector that needs to go on this duplex outlet because most outlets now are requiring that so they would know that uh, information so it doesn't usually specify it out here but this would take care of that because it would reference the canadian electrical code and so we have all of these outlets listed weatherproof. This one is a heavy duty outlet. And that's a fancy way of saying that it would be uh, used for a 220 or 240 volt um, outlet, which would be typical for your stove, uh, would be typical for your dryer and any other maybe heavy equipment that might be utilized for a particular um, purpose, a pool heater or something of that nature. Uh, also coming into fruition a lot now is um, the use of um, outlets for electric vehicles. Uh, I suspect that'll be very um, soon in the electrical code as a requirement for new houses. Uh, if it's not already as I speak, that's how these things change. Um, but that would require a 240 volt outlet as well. Um, so those are some of the uses for a heavy uh, duty outlet. Now the electrician would know that a dryer doesn't use um, quite the same amperage as a stove and so they can use a little bit lighter gauge on that 240 volt than say for a stove. Um, but again, they would be using the Canadian electrical code as their guide. So those are some of the symbols that you'll see for um, uh, the electricians as well as the lights, light fixture in a ceiling light fixture pull chain pull chain usually you'll find it in a basement um, you're not the a lot of these basements in production homes they're not finished so that's just a quick and dirty way of just uh, putting in some uh, lighting in the basement to meet the cec requirements um, wall mounted uh, pot light uh, so usually anytime you see pot lights usually with a p in them uh, so that would be that and um, switch 
You'll also see other ones, it doesn't show it there, uh, S3, like for a three-way switch. We'll talk about that. A lot of times these symbols, they don't have every symbol that's used on the drawing, but it's usually the best place to go check what's going on. Uh, you also see it says SA for smoke alarm, interconnected smoke alarm. That means one alarm goes off, the other ones will go off too. So they're wired together. Uh, you also carbon monoxide detector. Uh, you'll see now getting away from the um, plumbing aspect, you'll see floor drain. Usually you'll find the floor drain somewhere near the furnace because there's condensation that drips from the furnace so they hook it up. So they usually put the floor drain pretty close to where the furnace is. Hose bib. So that's where you can turn on and off your hose. Usually you'll find in production building you usually find two. Uh, one will be at the rear of the house and one will be inside the garage. In custom homes, could be as many as that particular homeowner wants. There could be other symbols that would be uh, going along for sprinkler systems, etc. Uh, so, or a sprinkler layout plan, which usually be on a separate drawing. So giving a, just giving you an idea of the overall uh, symbols that you'll see. And so let's take a, maybe a look and see uh, what, um, where they actually turn up. So in this being the Doncaster drawings, I'm starting in the basement. You see SA, you'll find an SA on every floor and now recent changes require an SA in the bedrooms. Um, so uh, in this case, you've got the smoke alarm in the basement. You've got a floor drain. Uh, so this would be the floor drain over here. As I mentioned, it'd be near the furnace. So F is standing for furnace. Um, HWT, you can guess that would stand for hot water tank. T would stand for laundry tub or tub. Um, so your plumbing hookups would have to uh, come there for your drain waste vent. So this would be uh, plumbed for, uh, there would be a condensate valve uh, or line that would run to the floor drain here. Um, very often they just run it on top of the surface of the on concrete and staple it there. Probably that wouldn't be the best though and when it's right in front of a floor drain. So it could be underneath um, the concrete if it was um, set up that way. There would be a TSP trap seal primer that would go from this faucet into the floor drain. So every time you turn on the faucet, water will leak into the floor drain to ensure the water, the trap maintains water in it. Um, so uh, older houses, it may dry out as I've discussed in the book and I've discussed in the previous videos that we've um, looked at. Okay, so we can also see that there's a line. So you gotta follow the line. Uh, and the line is where the switch will be. So this is going up the stairs, right? And it's got a little tiny arrow there. Um, so that would take you up the stairs. Uh, so this one, but then we see other ones and it says PC. So that's not president's choice. That stands for pull chain. And so that means these ones over here, you have to go and pull them. Uh, in, once you finish the basement, you're gonna change this. You're, you'd have it obviously on a switch. Uh, you probably have a switch at the bottom of the stairs. You have to have um, operability so that you can light up going down the stairs. On all the other stairs, you'll see three ways so that you can turn them on and off um, at, from the bottom to the top. Uh, you don't need it in a basement though because it, it doesn't matter. You can keep that one on there, although it might be nice to keep some controls there. That might be uh, something you want if you finish this basement at some future point. The other thing you see here is optional three-piece rough-in bath. And so this means that uh, for this particular house, if you pay extra, they would rough in for this basin here. Basin is the, the sink that you put in a bathroom, if that helps. Uh, toilet and bathtub. And so it would be roughed in for a standard like five-foot bathtub, toilet, coming out 12 inches from a wall, they would allocate something assuming you would frame the wall so that the waste would be there and the basin and running the vent lines for it um, so that it would be a fairly easy hookup to do later on. If they didn't do that, you have to break up the concrete floor, you have to find out where the drains are, you have to you know, hook up to the drains and you have to um, fill in the concrete again. So it's a lot more messy and it's a lot more work. Uh, Problem with this is, of course, later if you decide, well, I don't want to have the washroom here. I want to have the washroom down here or something. Um, then that means extra work too. Like it's, it's you still got to do the same thing because the washroom's not where you want it to be. Um, so that's uh, a consideration that comes into play. Uh, you also see here the electrical panel. 
So it says proposed electrical panel location, and it says alternate. So they have to get this proved, approved by the local hydro authority. So there are certain requirements they would have. So they make the suggestion of here or there um, so that then as long as the hydro authority approves it, then that's where they can locate it. So this would be their uh, primary location, but there might be some alter alternative reason why a hydro authority might want it in a different location. Uh, so they, the hydro authority ends up running the final wire to the house. And so that's their choice as to where they want to run it to the house. If it's above ground, they have a hydro uh, line poles, and that might be very specific where they will want to um, run it to and attach it to the side of the house. Most new production, it's run underground. Uh, so that offers a little bit more flexibility that way in new construction. Uh, but they're for sure not going to put it way at the back of the house when the hydro uh, the hydro service is running along the street at the front of the house, whether it's above ground or below ground is typical. Okay, and so that is that. And you see there's a mandatory outlet that has to be put beside the panel. So they've got the outlet beside the panel. Um, that's a, a code requirement there. All right, and as it's not a finished basement, there's not much else going on with regards to electrical. So we go upstairs and we can see that uh, we have uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, some of the unique, unique things maybe, you see this S and it's got a line going to a switch. So that's what we call a split switched receptacle. So the top of the outlet would be operated maybe by the switch and the bottom would be all the time have power. Uh, so, you know, if you shut the light off, but you have the TV plugged in, maybe you don't want the light on, right? You would still have power for the TV. That would be how that would be structured. Sometimes if you're, a, if you have an existing home and you're wondering why doesn't this outlet never works or sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, that was my brother-in-law. Uh, I just went over there and said, why don't you try flicking the switch here? Uh, that's what's uh, operating it, right? Um, so, uh, that's probably what's going on. It might be a split switch receptacle. Very handy if it's somewhere where you're going to put lamps um, to uh, light up the room. Because one of the things with this particular room, I don't see any lights in it. Uh, so it's expected that you're going to use a lamp to turn on and off in this room. Personally, I would have some lights as well, choice. At least some pot lights. Um, but uh, that's that's the base and that's you know that's how builders will typically do things and then if you want extras there's an extra charge for extra um, lights so maybe you do want a series of pot lights in this room uh, with a dimmer um, that would then require a switch and then the line would go to the pot lights around uh, here we can see we've got two lights so the kitchen's got plenty of lighting we've got uh, the light over here in the work area and then the light over here in the breakfast area where you'd probably have a table and you'd have sit down for breakfast. It has no indication of under counter lighting. That can be done in a different ways after the fact, but in this case there's no indication of it. Um, but you do see a lot of outlets and the build Canadian Electrical Code will require a lot of outlets and they have specific requirements with regards to um, the amperage of the circuits, I believe they're now 20 amp requirements. You can always tell 20 amp, it's got a little sort of little, like where you plug in, it's got this little funny T where you plug in. It looks a little bit different, uh, the outlet, and that's uh, signifying that it's a 20 amp outlet, which means it's not going to trip the circuit breaker in the panel so easily. Like you plug in a, uh, a, um, you plug in a uh, kettle and a toaster if they're on, you know, separate out, separate um, breakers. Then it's more difficult to flow those um, circuits. And our things that we use in the kitchen tend to use a lot of energy. So um, there's a lot of requirements around that to alleviate that because you don't want to be blowing circuits all the time, circuit breakers, because that's that's threatening. That just means you're using more current than those wires can handle. Like if you burn a trip a circuit breaker uh, that's 15 amps, it means that it was starting to draw current that was more than 15 amps. And if it does that over a period of time, it will melt, melt the sheathing on the wiring. And then that could potentially over time cause a fire. So um, those breakers are meant to protect you. So yeah, we've got these switches here. Uh, here you see, and if you look really 
closely. I'll see if I, oops, doesn't want to do it. Let's see. Let's see if I can get this to, no, it doesn't want to do it. Okay. Um, I'll go plus the slow way then. All right. So I like it when it's an iPad. What can I say? I like uh, looking at drawings on an iPad, not so much on a, la a laptop, even though I got a nice big screen in front of me. Um, that makes it nice. Uh, so uh, we have a switch and a three weight. That's a three there. And it didn't have that in the um, symbols uh, page. I'm kind of surprised it didn't, but that's a, for a three way switch. It's standard, it's universal. So you have, it goes to the light and then it goes over here. So that means I can operate this light here from this spot. So I could turn it on, walk through here. I'm going, I'm going to leave now and I could shut it off there. Same thing with at the stairs. At the base of every stairs, except for the basement one, because it's I'm not going to sh shut it off while I'm down there the way they've got it set up anyways. Um, you go up. And then when you get to the top of the stairs on the second floor, uh, then that's going to have another three way. So you, as you get to the top of the stairs, you can shut that off as you go towards the bedrooms. You can turn this one on so that it lights up the rest of the hallway so you can get to the bedrooms. So that's a three way switch, very, very commonly used uh, in a lot of um, places, even here, three way option. So that's three way optional. That's if you in the garage, um, opt for that entrance door here. So that's an optional entrance door, um, very valuable to do. So I would do it if you have an option for it. Uh, and there you go. And then you could always leave by the garage door, open the garage door, and then you could go out and shut the light off in there. Or you could enter from the garage door, turn the light on, and then shut it off when you go inside. So that's a three-way switch. There's also four-way switches. Uh, so you have a three-way uh, that's where you want to do it from three locations. So if you had like three locations, if you wanted to put another uh, switch over here and have it as a four way, you could then operate um, this light, sorry, from here um, to there. So you could have an, another switch there. Most architects for sure in um, low rise residential, they wouldn't put S4. There is a symbol S4 and that tells you it's being operated by from three spots, but my experience is on drawings, uh, usually you'll just see S3, 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 but you'll see the line going between them. So you'll know, okay, this switch operates, they all operate this light. So electrician would know, I gotta buy two three-way switches and one four-way switch. It's a different mechanism. You wouldn't tell the difference looking at them on the finished surface, they just look like regular switches, but the internal um, workings of it is different. And a four-way switch is, Oh, I don't want to say, but maybe maybe it's let's just say, for example, it's 25 bucks. A three way switch might be 15 bucks and a single switch. I don't know, four or five bucks. Um, not very expensive, especially if you start buying them in bulk. But there is a significant difference between a regular switch, the cost and a three way. And then there's even more expensive with a four way. But worth it if you have that kind of setup for sure. Um, so yeah, you see the outlets around. So these are just regular duplex. This one's a split switched duplex outlet. Um, here, it's just hardly you can see it. And a lot of times, uh, you know, the symbols and that, it's just because there's other information, other things going on. You might not see it that well, but you know that's a stove. That's all I need to know. There's gotta be a, a 240 volt power to that stove so that's pretty much um, what that's going to require even if somebody's putting in a gas stove they'd still put in for the electrical for a um, electric stove in case they change that or or whatever in the future um, so you have this um, for the stove and a lot of gas stoves too the oven is better with um, electric so uh, still you're going to have that re 240 requirement so, and if you're 220, 240, as far as this, that's just meaning the same thing, 110, 120. Um, don't worry about that, that difference. Um, so the stove is there. So that's the 220 outlet. I said that uh, a stove will have an exhaust fan vented to the exterior. So stove hood fan. So that's that little X pattern there showing that the cabinet would be there a little bit different height, the, the cabinets, and you'd have that hood fan exhausting out. So somebody's got to cut a hole through the wall uh, to exhaust that out. Better yet, have the hole there 
and the pipe there when you're bricking it up so it's done and then they just brick around it and it's done um, scheduling timing and making things easier don't make things more difficult um, than it is uh, so uh, we have over here we've got a washer and a dryer and um, there's another one so for the dryer the D and the W right washer dryer and there, I'm looking, for, if I see a dryer, I know there's going to be a 220 volt, right? Uh, there's an outlet for the washing machine, regular outlet. Uh, and there is your exhaust fan. It's kind of hidden in there. Um, so where you've got the dryer, you've got an exhaust fan. And then you can just see here that little duct going through because the dryer has to exhaust out. And there's number 22. Let's take a look. What does number 22 say for us? Number 22 says cap dryer vent, okay? So it has to exhaust um, outside. Um, and your fan, it doesn't really show it exhausting outside, but it will have to exhaust outside. Um, so that's the other um, point. Sometimes it will show them exhausting out, and other times uh, it won't. And sometimes that can get to be a challenge too. Like if I put it actually here and my joists are running this way, well, how am I going to run my um, exhaust out? So I might have to run it out through the joist in this direction. So I might end up running out through the wall over here. Um, these are some of the things that you don't notice. But I think about when I'm building, when we talk about constructability, I think about how am I going to run this? How is this going to go through? I'm, I'm thinking ahead. I'm thinking uh, with the end in mind. All right. And so this fan's here. It's nice. But what's involved with this fan? there's a duct. How am I going to run the duct and how am I going to get it outside? And then that ties to the structure when we talked about framing, which ways do the joists go in? Do, am I going to drop down a bulkhead so I can get this duct work um, pushed outside? Um, those are some of the things that um, come up. And I fully suspect that when we look at uh, the powder room, PR stands for powder room in this case, See here, it says finish ceiling 2270 AFF. Finish ceiling 2270 AFF above finished floor. So in here, it's got the finished ceiling is lowered, right? So it's a little bit um, lowered. Now, um, what? So we got 2270. Let's take a look at one of the elevations. Maybe I'm wrong on this, but I don't think so. Yeah, um, 2270. So finish ground floor. To finish second floor is 2670 and if I take off roughly 200 for the joist it's 184 um, I'm gonna have 2470 uh, so that's gonna leave me 2270 24 so about two it's gonna leave me a drop ceiling that's probably about like that much um, over over here so why why would you put a drop ceiling there probably because this is a heck of a long way from there. My joists are running this way. It'd be easy if I just drop the ceiling in this little tiny washroom and then I can run my, um, I can run my exhaust for the fan out through here or through there very easily. It won't be a big deal. Um, so that makes that easier um, from that perspective. So the designer was kind of thinking ahead on some of the issues, which is great. Um, and that makes it a lot um, easier that way. Otherwise, what tends to happen is you get to that point. It's like, now what are we going to do? Where are we going to run? And then you got an RFI for the designer and you're going back and forth and all this stuff. Um, this is better. This is um, clean. This is close enough, so it's not that far. They could run it definitely that way. You definitely don't want to run it this way because it's going to. you don't want to have that running out the front of the house. It doesn't look nice, right? Try to hide the grills at the sides or at the back uh, where it's... Um, it's not conflicting with the aesthetic appeal of the building. It's the same thing when we talk about roof vents. If I can have them more towards the back that's not on the front part of the roof, it looks a lot better. Um, so you'll see that very frequently done that way. Uh, so yeah, so here you can see uh, micro shelf and this is um, saying, looks like to me, it's saying 1500 uh, over here. Um, and this is looking like it's, um, or is that 1300? And again, if I'm not clear on that, I would get a clarification from 
um, the designer, right? So if I'm not clear on that height, I would get a clarification from the designer. The other thing we're going to talk about in chapter 13 is I would want the shop drawings for the kitchen layout. So yes, this is laid out and it shows where the sink is and all likelihood that's the way it is. And in this particular house, it is the way it is. But in the real world, if I'm doing a custom home or if I'm uh, doing it uh, renovation or etc., whatever your final drawings are, the client ends up going to, in the case like this, they go to a decor center and they make certain choices. And that might change some things, right? So I'd want to make sure that the cabinets are laid out, that I'm looking at the shop drawings for how they're being built. That would take priority over something here. So if the shop drawings, for example, showed that maybe this client didn't want a microwave shelf, maybe they wanted to sit on the counter, the microwave. Um, so there's maybe a different layout. I want to make sure I'm putting the outlets exactly at the right location and the right spot so that Number one, they're not in the way of the counter or they're in the way of the cabinets. Because I want to, once the drywall's on, I don't want to be opening the drywall up and fixing and rerouting things. Very expensive. Causes a lot of delays. So you're thinking these things through as you, as you go through the process. Of course, here's our other smoke alarm here. Um, so you can see that there. You can see the mirror in the powder room sort of uh, effect here. Um, like I said, the drop ceiling that's going on. You can see here there's a, a, another split switch receptacle, S to a switch here. Uh, in the living area, um, you can see um, outlets around. There's building code requirements. So today, um, and it, I, it's got to do with how long a typical lamp cord is, and there's got to be room that you could go swing it either way to an outlet. The code, Canadian Electrical Code, tries to minimize that you're going to need extension cords for things, right? Um, they want to make it safe. They don't want people running cords under carpets in like the old days and that sort of thing. That causes fires. So there's a lot of strict requirements around that. So typically, you do pretty good with outlets. Look, you got one here, you got one there, you got one here, you got one there. So pretty much every wall, there's an outlet that you can place um, things on you got a ton of outlets around in the kitchen like i was mentioning one for the fridge the dishwasher connection one above counter here one above here 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 so there's a lot of um a lot of outlets around in the garage you've got um one outlet over here and is that it uh there's usually also oh there oh i'm just not seeing it there you go there would be a, at least one there and one there. Um, very often, too, uh, for the garage door, you have outlets in the ceiling uh, requirements. So you look for those. Uh, hose bib, this is for your plumbing. So that's where you'd hook up the hose, typically in a garage and usually one in the back. As I said, if it's custom, it could be in a lot of places. W weatherproof outlet, it's outside. So you can look around the perimeter. You can see what kind of weatherproof outlets. Then you see over here, switch. Oh, you can see another outlet right in there as you come in the entry. Switch to the pot light, pot light, pot light. So that one switch operates these three pot lights. So they're up in the ceiling of the part of the roof that goes over the porch and that little part of the roof that goes over the garage. There's one over each garage door. And that kind of looks like it. There's the other weatherproof um, uh, outlet. So if I um, go up to the second floor, uh, you can see again, a lot of outlets around, nothing in the walk-in closet. This is the attic access hatch. So if you need to get out access to the attic at any point, uh, let's check insulation levels. Uh, if you get uh, critters uh, breaking in through, the sea, in through the roof, that kind of stuff, you've got access to um, the attic. So they will usually have the attic access hatch hidden and concealed in some uh, if they're smart in some closet like this. So that's a that's a good um, location. In the washroom here, you can see there's an outlet and it's got a height on it. So that should be above the counter. Again, you want to make sure it's above the counter. Uh, so uh, typically uh, standard heights in for vanities used to be uh, 32 inches in a bathroom, but that's kind of changed over the years. I see a lot more that are 36 inches in height. And uh, so then you want to make sure that this is going to be above that. Plus, if, if you've got like a 
uh, granite with a short splash or you've got a laminate countertop you want to make sure the outlets are far enough enough above that it'll be above the splash for they call it the splash the back of the countertop or the back of the granite piece that you're putting on the wall if, it, if you're doing that sometimes a lot of times granite just runs straight in and you have ceramic tile come down that's okay uh, here you see a switch it goes to the toilet and that would operate the fan over the toilet so you just barely see the fan it looks like it's part of the toilet but it's not it's the switch going to that and then that would exhaust out we've got the bathtub if this was a jacuzzi tub i would be looking at the shop drawing and i would be also making sure that i order the jacuzzi that i could have access to the motor because the motors always break right and so you should have an access door so the easiest way would to cut a, would be to cut an access door in the side of this vanity so that if the, the motor ever breaks, you could access it through the vanity. That would be a pretty good um, location. Second location would be an access door through here. You'd have to probably take the toilet out if you were working on the motor, but um, that would be it. You want to avoid having an access door on the front. It looks awful. Uh, so I've seen it, uh, but it looks uh, awful. You can usually plan these things out pretty well. You can even have, say, the jacuzzi tub was here. You could have... Uh, not in this case, this is a shower, but if it was in uh, like, um, say, the, say the jacuzzi tub was here, you could have the access door in the closet that's behind it. That would look okay, that'd be fine. You try to plan these things out ahead and think them through. That's why the shop drawings that we talk about in chapter, uh, in chapter 11 with the building systems is important. You wanna know, and then you also wanna know, can I, is there a, a mirror image design where the motor's on the other side that it's more accessible and you order the right one? Otherwise, if you don't think these through, guaranteed the one will come with the motor on the wrong side and then somebody puts the, the access door on the outside and it doesn't look very nice. So this is more of the same thing. The switches, the lights, the switches, the lights, the outlets, you can sort of see that all the way along. When you get into ICI and commercial, there's a lot more symbols and they tend to follow the CSA standard symbols uh, for uh, outlets and things like that. Like if it was a split switch, that would be darkened on one side, uh, but they typically don't do that in residential drawings. So I, I don't think I'll get into that with uh, this uh, particular uh, course because we are focused in on residential. Uh, I do have the typical symbols in chapter four, so you could look at them and they, they are more applicable uh, to ICI as well. So if you see the ones that are used differently, this is clarifying it, I hope for you. All right, and so that's kind of uh, looking at uh, the uh, Doncaster house uh, with the electrical and we looked at the furnace and we looked at the plumbing. We can see the toilet here. This is the shower. Uh, this is the drain for the shower. Uh, this is the basin. This is a light over the basin here. Uh, again, I think this isn't very good, the lighting, because I think this is a pretty big bathroom. Um, might have been nice to have another light over here, maybe. Uh, but uh, those are things that you would look at when you're determining what you want to do. Uh, oh, a few more things, maybe on the insulating side, too. Uh, so this is our second floor, and maybe I'll shrink it a little bit. So this is our second floor. And when we look down on it, this is the ceiling area here. So the building code requires that you have one 300th ventilation in the ceiling. And so your ventilation requirements for roof vents will require that you have one to 300 um, ventilation. And if we scroll down, this is basically that we're going to put roof vents in our roof. And so each roof vent depends on the size of the roof vent, how much it ventilates, but you'd want to have it more or less kind of, sorry, I'll go back here, more or less kind of um, distributed around this roof. So probably you're going to put some roof vents along here. You're going to have some roof vents here and here. You'd probably try to avoid them over here um, simply because uh, it doesn't look as nice from the street. But if you had enough adequate all the way around here, that should take care of that as well the soffit is vented all the way around and you would need to have some roof vents in this section even though you got the soffit vent over here to ventilate this but this isn't such a big area um, from that perspective so where does it talk about that hmm, let's see let's see 
uh, you might you might see something like a, a number here uh, it might tell you about um, the roof vents uh, sometimes it you might want to look at the section of the house it might tell you something about uh, the roof vents um, so um, here I don't think that's going to do it because I think it's a little bit higher number but let's go check uh, so you might have to do a little bit of digging on that if I uh, recall uh, oh no it's perfect number one roof construction look at that beautiful number one roof construction talks about all the things that we've talked about before asphalt shingles plywood sheathing pretty thin plywood those H clips that we've talked about in previous recorded sessions in the course um, talks about um, some damp proofing eave protection coming up uh, the, the underneath the shingles uh, so best for the ease protection you know you put like a, a ice and water shield which self seals around the nails um, so that you don't get um, ice damming occurring uh, so that sort of thing we'll probably talk about that in one of our upcoming cases and uh, down here attic ventilation so this is a building code requirement straight from the building code and it says one to three hundred uh, of insulated ceiling area with 50 percent at the eaves so that's why we have a vented soffit that soffit with all the little holes in it allows air to flow up into the attic and then you're going to put roof vents in the roof that allows it to flow out um, so that's sort of that ventilation process we also see for insulating purposes we see um, our walls we can see in here if we actually look closely these are hatchings and that's that's the hatching for a bat insulation and this is the hatching for a brick and we know if we look at the front elevation of this house it'll say face brick and it behind it is essentially um, going to be uh, the bat insulation in the stud walls so this house is primarily insulated with bad insulation um, in the actual ceiling area number I think that's probably still going to be under number one uh, roof construction da, da, da. we have our uh, asphalt shingles beyond no I don't think it's got it there this the actual ceiling well we've got a number of ceiling areas here um, so this is um, half inch Egyptian this is uh, in the ceiling between the house and the garage so this is um, uh, asking for, for on walls and ceiling between house and so we've got R24 bat insulation in the walls and we've got R40 in the ceiling and likely they would um, in this particular case they're showing that it would be um, R40 in the ceiling and we'd have R24 in the walls if we look down and we see brick veneer construction uh, and we follow this down there we go roof insulation so number nine roof insulation and six mil air vapor barrier so in this case you got R60 in the roof R60 in the roof uh, so that would be um, the requirements there if the building code changes that's the first thing that changes more insulation higher r values the technologies change you could never before get like an r24 or r22 in a wall uh, now you're starting to see uh, manufacturers of like owens corning and dow come up with um, bad insulation that can actually do that uh, so the technology is constantly improving that way the building code as we move towards net zero is requiring higher and higher r values so there you go there's your r value bat insulation in the walls um, as an example and uh, one more thing you'll notice here it says the soil gas control in my textbook I've got some uh, references to the building code here uh, and that's actually referring to radon gas uh, radon gas is a topic for another day, day but soil gas is radon gas it's been proven as a known uh, carcinogen and there's some houses that they have toxic levels uh, some areas uh, are worse than others um, uh, I believe around Port Hope and that there's been a lot of tailings that um, from uh, one of the plants out there that caused some problems in you know some very sort of narrow specific 
areas. So what they do is to mitigate that, um, they have you, now the new code requires that there has to be like a T connection under the slab so that you can easily um, run up a pipe and exhaust it out um, later on if that's found to be an issue in that particular house. You know, you can have one house on the street that has a problem and the rest don't have a problem with it. But if you have a gravel base underneath the slab and you have this T connection, then it's pretty easy to um, put an exhaust motor and greatly reduce the levels that may accumulate inside and over time cause a problem. It's not something that causes instant problems, it's something that over time uh, causes a problem. So that's how they address that uh, in the um, code so that it makes it easy for homeowners later on if there's some sort of issue that way or they get it checked and they find out it's an issue. It's not like I can say a particular area is, has more or less. Um, there are areas in Canada that have uh, that more higher quantities, uh, parts in Manitoba, you know, uranium in the ground, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, uh, it's not like a prolific uh, big issue, but the code does um, address it that way. So it's something to know about and you can research that a little bit more. I do have a section in the textbook on that as well. Okay, so I'm gonna flip to, uh, no, I don't need to flip to anything. I just need to flip here. Okay, I'm gonna flip to the Brook drawings. And the Brook drawings, just to give you a quick uh, review, but everything that I told you in here will um, give you the idea, uh, the same idea. Big difference though in the Brook drawings, you know, here you've got your legend, like I said before, all your information. The, the data about um, floor areas and stuff they did on this page. Doncaster, they had it on the one page, um, but that's already over here for your code require for your permit requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. And over here, we've got all the symbols again. Uh, and if I scroll down uh, significantly enough, I should find it. Maybe. Is it going to regenerate? Yes, no. Uh, okay, I guess I lost it there. Okay, that's there it is. So I'm just going to rotate the drawings. And the big difference with the Brook drawings is it has a separate page, page 16 of 19, which has the electrical layouts just by themselves on it. So, and it also repeats the symbols right here. So it's nice and easy to see. Um, you just have to know which one that you're actually looking at. Uh, and it says, you know, what you're looking at. If you're looking at the lower level plan, elevation A, if it's the finished lower level plan, then it's going to have all these extra outlets along the walls because it's actually finished, right? This part of it's finished. This part's not finished. There's your proposed electrical uh, panel location. They're not giving alternates in this case. And you can gather all that information um, that we were talking about. This would be a split switched receptacle, right? Um, some of it may be a little bit difficult to see uh, just um, because it's kind of shrunk down. So you might have to zoom in and look at it. Like that's hard to see, but it's going up a stairs. And you know if it's going to go up a stairs to a second floor and it's going to go down from a second floor, it's going to be a three-way switch. That's a for sure. So um, that little thing that looks blurred there, that's going to be a three-way switch. Uh, and at the top, that little thing that looks like a, a small little number, that's a three for a three-way switch. So that's going down the stairs to lighten it up. This one, we've got the washer and dryer in a closet on the second floor. So that's a little bit different. Uh, we've also got an exhaust fan because it's, you know, you got the dryer hook up in there. So we've got an exhaust fan in there. And so you're going to have a special outlet, a 220 or 240 volt outlet there. Um, so you've also got a regular outlet that would be for the washer. This would be one of those stacking ones, you know, that saves space, I'm assuming. Uh, in that case, you can see the fan here for the, for the washroom over here, the ensuite. And then you've got basically for double lights over the double sinks. You've got a outlet here 
um, as well. That would have to be on a GFI because it's close to the sinks in case you drop your um, blower, hair blower in the sink and it uh, could electrocute you, so that's why it's on a GFI. Walk-in closet, nothing fancy going on. You can see the outlets across. Most of the bedrooms have a single light. Here's a three-way going down the stair, down the little stairs to the technology center. So you can, as you go up the stairs, and then you can shut it off. All of those kind of things. Another exhaust fan over here, exhaust fan there, exhaust fan here. Um, so um, you can pick those ones up as well. Powder room, exhaust fan. Uh, so you can see them. Uh, this stove, it would have a exhaust fan going out. That would be the hood um, on top of it. Uh, so you see that. So you got to switch here to a light, switch here to a light. Uh, with the island has an outlet built into the island. Weatherproof outlets. These look like they're actually mounted on the side, so they're not pot lights. They're actually just side mounted like scones. Uh, here's one weatherproof outlet hose bib hose bib uh, so uh, you get the you get the drift of how this um, sort of flows out very similar to the other ones so nothing too um, dramatic uh, going on here oh ceiling outlet ceiling outlet so this would be for the garage doors so you know you have electric openers pretty much everybody does that now so uh, ceiling outlets uh, there and this is saying 42 inches from the floor so from the floor slab. This is assuming you would have this, it's not even um, optional, you would have this uh, entrance door um, to the garage here in this particular case. So yeah, you see that and you, can, you got some of the alternatives and how they look different perhaps, not much different though from what I see. Uh, so uh, the insulating requirements, this is a little bit different. Uh, Insulation wise than the Doncaster, uh, this one's got a spray foam over here, um, this flat area over here with this roof. So it has a, a spray foam in it and uh, the ceiling again, probably similar. Maybe it doesn't have quite, uh, we'll see what the R value is in a minute. Uh, you can also see uh, the garage ceiling, I believe will be spray foam. It should tell you that when we get to the floor plans uh, for the garage. So I'll just move it up. That hatching there, that's referencing a spray foam. Spray foam insulation for drop ceiling. There's different spray foam types. It doesn't list it here, I don't think. Let's check number 19. I don't think it does uh, 19 other than the R value. Does it say the spray foam type? Uh, so we've got uh, gypsum board on walls and ceiling between house, R20 bad insulation in the walls with an R5 outside of that. Uh, it's saying R40. So it's just saying R40 in the ceiling, but it's going to be a spray foam. So you could use a half pound or you could use a two pound depending on what the requirements are for it. It's just different densities of spray foam and uh, the heavier, the two pound has uh, more density. It's kind of comparing like extruded polystyrene to expanded polystyrene. Extruded has a more dense quality to it and it has a higher R value um, to it. And again, depending on whose manufacturer spray foam it is, uh, you have to look at it as to how it behaves as a vapor barrier or a air barrier or both because they have different qualities to them. Uh, so here we can see that it's listing the R values for the various locations that you would have um, your insulation brought in. And like over here too, uh, you've got uh, uh, insulation. So you've got rigid R5, rigid insulation. Um, then you got the RSI R20. So this is giving you R25 in the walls because it's got one inch rigid insulation on the outside of the two by six walls. Then you've got bad insulation on the inside and that bad insulation is an R20 bad insulation it's requiring and plus the R5 on the outside, R25. Very good um, as, I, as I speak, but they always up the R values, right? Uh, foundation walls, so again, it's got the information about the foundation walls and requirements. And then if you go down, um, 
roof insulation, R50. So the Doncaster actually had a higher level of uh, roof insulation on that. Uh, I think they've recently upped it that it's even more than R50, the ceiling insulation. But for our purpose, as long as you know where to find the information, what the current code requirements are, what this has been accepted under the permit that you applied for, then that's um, what you're installing for this particular uh, project. Because there's specific requirements within the building code of when a code changes, how that transition takes place. And if you've already received the permit and started construction, it's fine for the code that you applied and received that permit. So there's transition requirements between codes when they change. It's not like you're 95% done and now you got to go back and meet the new code that just changed today. That's not how it works. Okay, so I think that should give you a good idea on uh, reading and interpreting uh, drawings for building systems and reading and interpreting drawings for um, insulation requirements and what the insulation requirements are. And remember, use these symbols. If I'm asking you about a specific insulation value, try to help use the symbols to help you. There was one more thing I did want to take a look at is the roof plans uh, on this. Uh, if we go to the roof plans, I think I might buy it. Let me just shrink this down. Maybe I'll rotate it around. Uh, and uh, if we go, there it is. As I was saying, you see how they've got, these are, these are representing the roof vents. So they're trying to not have it sort of be crowded with roof vents on the front of the house so much that you'd see it from the street. Um, so they're trying to uh, avoid that. So they've got them uh, listed around back here instead of putting them here. And then the ventilation would have to add up to meet at least one to 300 square. So if you got a thousand square feet, you got three and a third square feet of s ventilation you need in the attic split up between the vented soffits and the roof vents. So that's that. Okay. So I think that's what I wanted to cover today. Hopefully that's given you a little bit of an idea of how to read and interpret drawings with regards to um, building systems. Uh, there you see another exhaust for the fireplace here. Uh, building systems and um, the building envelope and the type of information that you find there. You'll find uh, requirements, one more thing, uh, with the building envelope like the um, air vapor barrier uh, requirements you'll usually see it listed they'll say a six mil poly or a six mil uh, polyethylene and that's referring to um, the air uh, vapor um, barrier so you see over here it's sort of listing six mil air vapor barrier on warm side so again my lecture on the uh, and my chapter in the textbook on 12, we get into that in more detail, what that actually means. Uh, and there's that other one, 1 to 300 on these drawings as well. And there's that Ontario Building Code, you know, unless uh, all these requirements revised uh, 2012. Um, okay, so I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing everybody a wonderful day. And until next time, enjoy the weekend. Bye for now.